Hello, how are you all doing? Good. <laughs> I remember about a year or 11 ago, I was writing a piece of software and it wasn't going very well. I was creating a tournament scheduler for a local futsal club and I remember that the first version was working was performing, but they just had it a little, a little tweaks here and there to make the resulting schedule better. And the second version wasn't really performing anymore. It gave a result, but it took like a day. The third version wasn't even finishing anymore. So I thought, I'll just change a couple of things around and it'll be better again and I can get this to work. I spent an hour on it. Spend another hour on it, spend the rest of the day on it, part of next day, and then I had to admit to myself, I'm not just stuck, I'm lost. I am so lost, I might as well just throw everything away that I did the last couple of days and start over. Can you remember the last time that you were truly lost in code? I immediately saw a hand go up, you know, I see a lot of people. Yeah, truly lost. I mean, no amount of tooling or whatever would have saved me at that point. I was lost, lost. And I kind of took that moment to metaphorize it as going through the jungle. Without my machete, without my compass, without my tools. Lost, lost. Now from that day forth, I decided I was not going to get lost anymore. <laughs> it's mostly worked out. And so I became interested in an idea called refactoring. Who has never heard of refactoring? Good, most people have. So if I were to ask you in the audience, name me a code smell. Who could name a code smell? Who could name a code smell along with the appropriate refactoring? Who could name two code smells along with the appropriate refactorings? Who could name five? Yeah. Not very many. Now this question isn't original, it's not my question, it's a question that a wonderful programmer called Sandy Metz asked her audience once in a really good talk, get a whiff of this. Um, I think everyone should check out that talk. So, <laughs> now her talk is about given all these code smells and their appropriate refactorings, here's a piece of pretty bad code, identify the smells apply the refactorings, and everything will be better. The only problem is you have to know all the code smells and their appropriate refactorings, but once you do, everything will be fine. Now, I don't know all the code smells, I don't know all the refactorings. I probably should spend some time learning those, but who has time these days? So that's not what we're going to do today. But what we are going to do today is inspired by the refactoring book. It's inspired by some of those other people that I like to watch their talks of. And it's inspired by an experience that I had actually. Because what we're gonna do is not so much the refactoring book itself that everyone should read at some point. We're gonna focus on the author who wrote the foreword. Do you know who wrote the foreword to Martin Fowler's refactoring book? Anyone? Let's shout it out. Ken Beck. Very good. So Ken Beck has a canonical thing he says that I like very much and that we're going to do today. And that thing is make the change easy and then make the easy change. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to create space in our application for a new feature to come along. Instead of focusing on creating the feature in the software as it is, we are first going to clean up a little bit. 
So before we look at code, let me introduce you our case study. We are going to look at a piece of software of a fictional company called Meet Inc. And Meet Inc. is a competitor of meetup.com and they host events and try to sell tickets to those events. The problem is that their code is pretty bad and as such, they spend a lot of money on fixing things. So we're going to help them. We're going to look at a piece of code today and we're going to help them fix it. Now, why did I chose this particular domain? Well, we all know it. We are here at a kind of meetup. So we kind of understand what's happening in this domain. But this domain is also very interesting because there's a lot of rules that you can imagine. Interesting interaction between various parts of the domain and it has time. And who doesn't like working with time? But to be perfectly honest, when we started onboarding a lot of junior developers, we did a session with them, a mob programming session. If you've never done mob programming, please do it sometime. It's really, really cool. We did onboarding with juniors with mob programming and we had to pick a module out of our own product to work on. So it's kind of a little bit of our code. We're going to look at a piece of actual code from our actual code base. There's four components to the story that we'll be doing today. We have a ticket service, and that ticket service, we are going to ask for tickets. And that ticket service requires some collaborators to answer this question. And the function we're going to look at is this one. This is probably the worst legacy you've ever seen. <laughs> It's not the worst legacy you've ever seen, but it is legacy that fits inside a talk, so that's good, I hope. But there's a couple of interesting things going on here. Anything in particular that catches your mind? You know what? It doesn't even matter. Legacy code, it's fine as long as there are no feature requ requests. Ah, oh, shit. There's a feature request. That means we're going to have to touch it. Ah, and here I thought I was going to have an easy hour. Okay, but it's fine. You know, we'll just take a look at the tests. Uh, if there's no tests failing, everything's right, right? So this is a little bit of a problem. How are we going to do this one? Hmm. You know what? It's fine. We'll write the tests as we go. Let's, let's just take a look at what we have. So we have this thing here. So what, what do we see? What's, what's interesting about this function? Shout it, shout it out loud. Anything you see. Arguments. Yeah, that's the thing. Code duplication, yeah. If statements, nested if statements, nested if statements in a for each. Why not? Boolean flags, really good. Anything else? No comments. Who writes comments? <laughs> yeah. One more I would add is getting stuff calling collaborators as we go. What else do we call collaborators at other places? Yeah, here, check aloud. There's a lot going on here. And that's not even all of it, because there's another call here. Let's see what's in there. Oh, that's not too bad. Just a couple of ifs. New daytime, that means no date injected. That's going to be rough for testing. But otherwise, this isn't too bad, right? So look at ticket. It's not too bad. Just a couple of properties. Some are not required. Nothing too fancy going on there. Let's look at the repository. Just a bunch of queries. 
We can deal with that. So where do we go from here? What do we do? Yeah, let's write a test for the existing code. So how do you go about that? You have a lot of, of code here that has given the number of for each's and ifs, a ton of execution paths. What do you do? Probably, yeah, we're probably gonna have to mock. I think you said mock. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what I would do in this case, I would just you know, look at the user interface or whatever that's wrapping this thing and just try different inputs. Spend like a day on just figuring out what does this thing do? So let's, assuming that we have some idea of what this thing does, let's see how we could write a test for this. So apparently, we want to test that we can get available tickets. Does that make sense? I really like this given when setup. It reminds me a little bit of BDD, which I don't know enough about. But it's a really good way to say, okay, so here's what we start with, and then this stuff happens, and then we expect a certain behavior. And you could create this based on some <laughs> clicking through of the application, or perhaps you have uh, an API or whatever, some means to call this. Perhaps you can debug and see what happens because all we really want to do at this point is lock down the current behavior of the system. That's all we want to do. We want to make sure that once we start making changes, only the external, uh, the, only the internal behavior changes. The external behavior should, change, should not change. So this test is just meant to lock down the current behavior. Now these givens and whens, they could look something like this. The givens, not too bad, just creating a couple of collaborating objects, but the whens are mocking. Anyone here unfamiliar with mocking? Let me see a couple of hands. So mocking, mocking means we are going to take out a part of our system and replace it with fakes with objects that were created only for the purpose of this test and that we can put expectations on. So here, we create a mock for the repository and we expect that when a function is called on this mock object, it returns certain behavior. The great thing about mocks is that you can isolate the part of your system that you want to test predict how the environment around that part of the system is going to behave, put expectations on the part of your system that you want to test, which is the subject under test, doesn't have to be a single class, often is. The bad thing about mocks is that they suck. Mocks create expectations on the inner workings of our subject. And that's rough when we want to refactor. So sometimes these tests, especially when using mocks, can lead to brittleness. That means that when you change some internal feature, the test will fail, even though what you did was internal. But for now, this is the way we will lock down our system. And it's all it is. We're just locking down the current behavior. Let's look at another test. Test that available tickets filters disallowed tickets. So apparently not all users can get all tickets. Again, we have certain expectations, givens and whens, and there's a new when in here. A when in here that's even more problem problematic, problematic, troublesome, problematic. When the user has only that ticket allowed. Now, why is that a problem? Well, we know from the internal workings that check allowed will be called for each ticket. So that means that on consecutive calls, <laughs> this. Ay, ay, ay. It's fine. We're just locking down the current behavior of the system. Let's look at another one or two. 
So given that certain tickets are sold out, the user should not be able to get them anymore, but the user should still be able to reserve the tickets that were sold out. Are we starting to get a little bit of an idea of what this code is about? What kind of behavior we expect from our big, app, big method? All right. So let me stress once more that all we've done so far is locking down the current behavior of the system. We've erected scaffolding. In the same way that if you were to clean up, refactor an old building, you would put scaffolding around it and then clean up the scaffolding afterwards, I would expect in similar manner here, we erect this scaffolding so that we can clean up and afterwards we should probably tear down this scaffolding. Now you could leave the tests that we've wrote, but then you would have perhaps some other coworker coming in, making changes and finding out that the tests break even though they're not really broken because of this brittleness of the mocking. So I kind of still would advise you to tear down the tests after you're done, delete them when they're not useful anymore, but whatever works for you. Are we ready? So, what are we doing? Well, I highlighted a couple of things that I think we should look at first. I find it very confusing to have an algorithm do stuff while it's calling other things. Maybe that's my personal pet peeve, but I like when the algorithm is working that everything is prepared. So the first thing I'm gonna do here, I'm just gonna split getting all the data and executing the algorithm. Now that's a very easy refactoring. If you use a proper machine, it's Shift F6 in PHP Storm. If you use a Mac, I have no idea. It's Control Alt V, not Shift F6. Um, so that would need something like this. So I've taken all these function calls inside the if statements and just parked them up top. That means we add another for each. How bad is it to add another for each? What's the overhead of a for each? It's negligible. Negligible, it doesn't matter. And we're probably gonna get rid of it anyway. For now, we just wanna create some space for ourselves to think. So the next thing I would do is check out this part here. What does it mean for these two duplicate algorithms? Why are they different? Well, they're basically the same, it's just that one part uses one of the other arrays given the conditional of for reserve. We can deduplicate that. We can first decide which, uh, which array to use and then do the algorithm. And that would look something like this. And now we've already created some more thinking space for ourselves. There's no confusion anymore between the different arrays. There's now only uh, algorithms. There's now only one algorithm, and the confusion is now entirely in which data to get. But we can look into that. So let's do. Let's figure out what this piece of code here does. Because the word available, the word available is in here a lot. So that's probably a special word. So let's figure out what this thing here does. So one thing that catches my eye is this piece of code is on two thoughts. On the one hand, we're just looking at ticket things, and on the other hand, we are using that array of current sold tickets. Let's split the two. Let's make that explicit. Can we say anything? about the other three ifs. Ticket is public, ticket start date, ticket end date. So I guess that means something on whether the ticket says it can be sold or not. That's my guess. And the other thing says current sold per ticket and number of tickets. What would that mean? Pro 
Sorry? Bit bit bit. Whether there are tickets left, whether there are physically tickets left or something like that, whether they're not sold out. So let's make that explicit. So we could say that check availability means whether the ticket is open for sale and whether there are still tickets left for sale. So we've put some of our understanding into the system and that's dangerous at this point because we don't really know a whole lot about it yet. But it would also be pretty easy to undo. So for now I'm gonna roll with this. What to do next? I'm interested in this part here. So we have a function that gets a single entity as an argument. Why is this not a function of ticket? But we also have this thing here. Hmm. So what if we move this function to ticket and then inject the date? Well, that could look something like this. So now, the service doesn't have to do that anymore. It delegates to the entity. And the entity only needs to know what day is it today. Everybody still following along? So if we look back at check availability, that really doesn't add too much anymore at this point. We keep talking about available, available, available. The other function was talking about available. This function is talk ava talking about available. So let's get rid of this function and pull whatever was in here in line into the other function again. So we can start working with it there. So instead of calling check availability here, we're just going to call the functions that check availability would call otherwise and get rid of check availability itself. Because there's something interesting that happens here. Can anybody remember what this function would return given an empty array? Ooh. Dig, dig, dig. If this array is empty, or if there is no key in there for the current ticket, it just returns true. So that means that we can get rid of it here and be a little bit more explicit about the difference between tickets being available for reserve or otherwise, whatever that means. You mentioned it, the flag. Why are flags a code smell? Do you have an idea? Yeah, two different behaviors in one function. So instead, we should probably split over this parameter and see if we can make two functions of it. Now at this point, because we have tests, why not just do a YOLO? We're just going to see if we can get an early return in there with a gamble and see if we can get something going. If not, we'll just undo it. So we're just going to see if we can... Oh, no, wait, that's not going to work. But we're close. So given this parameter, we're just going to try and do an early return. And basically, when this function was called, even though there was all kinds of behavior in there, when this function was called, with not public only, all it was doing was getting the tickets and putting the ID in front of it in associative array. Well, we can do that. And while we're at it, we'll split it over two functions and make explicit that one part of this is getting publicly available tickets and the other part is privately available tickets. Now with this understanding, 
the function that we started with isn't necessary anymore. We can still keep it around, but we can also mark it as deprecated, and any code that would call it can still call it, but it can also call the specific function, as long as we publicize the other two functions that we created. This means that we've significantly reduced the cognitive load on calling that big function with four parameters. It's only three parameters now. And seeing a function call with true or false, in my opinion, it's much harder to understand what happens than seeing a function with public or private in the name. So we've made this concept of publicly and privately available tickets more explicit in the hopes of creating space. Now let's look at what else we can do. Perhaps we should do the same thing for the other one. But this one is a little bit more tricky. Ticket is available, ticket is allowed. Well, at least there's no other bull in here anymore. So that means that this if is much easier to understand but it's still like there's two algorithms inside this one for each, and they have different meanings. So let's make explicit what these two choices, what they add. Because the first part says we're going to filter by available tickets, whatever that means, we're still not entirely sure. And the second part says we're going to filter by allowed tickets. So let's make that filtering explicit and split this into two loops. The one part says, what are the tickets that after halfway through are left to work with? And the second part says, okay, given these tickets, which one are allowed? That also means we can start inlining part of this decision making again, because now it's not a complex decision anymore, it's just a call that delegates. There's nothing complicated going on here anymore, so let's just get this back in there, and we've reduced the load on our mind another little bit. And we're left with this complex choice that we should probably split up as well. So how would that look like? Well, this thing, it's basically doing the same thing that we saw before. There are two decisions being made, whether the ticket is open for sale on and whether the ticket is left for sale, or whether there are tickets left to sell. So let's do the same thing. We're going to split this for each with a decision into another two for each's that both do their own decision. So the first part of that would be this. We look at which tickets are open and the second part would be which tickets are left. Now that means that this part here, that will, in the case of this for reserve, always be the first one. We can conditionalize, instead of this choice for which array to use, we can conditionalize the entire for each. Because the entire for each does nothing unless for reserve, unless not for reserve. I can't even read it. It's still too much to read. So this part here, instead of choosing which array and then doing the algorithm, we're going to choose whether or not to do the algorithm. And that will look like this. And we're starting to get a pretty good sense of what's going on, especially when we, because all the ifs are now easy, inline all the data that we gathered before. All of this can be inlined because none of the decisions are that complex anymore. And suddenly, we start to see an algorithm that takes a set and reduces it in every step. And that was completely unclear in the first version that we started with. 
And just by applying several small changes, we have let this behavior emerge. But it's still, yeah. Because this for reserve thing, I think this is in the wrong order. We were tricked with this ordering because of the previous version of the code. But basically, this for reserve thing says, well, if for reserve instead of not for reserve, we can do an early return, except that we still have to clean up afterwards. So let's switch these two around, put an early return in there, and see what happens. Now we are left with a very explicit moment where we can split up the two functions again over this Boolean. But we're also at the point that we've made explicit what happens here. We start with a set of tickets that are open for sale, then we go to a set of tickets that are allowed and open, and then we move to a set of tickets that are actually purchasable. So let's make that explicit. Let's take these three thoughts of this one function and make them all explicit. So we're gonna start with this first part, get it out of there, give it a nice name, something like this, tickets, for, uh, tickets open for sale on. Move to the second part and give that a nice name as well, something like tickets user can reserve. And then we can move to the third part, oh wait, no we can easily move to the third part because the workflows aren't split neatly. There is a variable that's being used here, so we have to inline that first, and then we can split the workflows. We can get the second part out of here, and we moved to the same situation as before. We have a function that does nothing more than deciding over a Boolean. We can deprecate that, publicize the other functions, and we're left with a couple of very explicit methods that have meaningful names and small behavior. And the tests are still passing because we didn't touch anything crazy. What were we doing again? We were creating space to implement this feature. And we have some space, but not enough just yet because we have created this tickets open for sale on. But it's still using a dependency that has to be mocked. Does it have to? What would it cost us to move tickets into meeting? That means that every time we load a meeting, the tickets have to be loaded as well. But it does make our tests a lot easier. So I'm just gonna do it. And if a coworker disagrees, we'll hear it. So this function, it doesn't need meeting as a parameter anymore because meeting is implicit in this. The tests are still passing, even though we've probably broken other tests. And now we have a wonderful space for our new feature. A very simple function that we're going to burden with a little bit of extra responsibility. So we start off, of course, by writing a new test um, sorry, an overview of what the service would look like when we're done. We can get rid of these two functions or just keep them marked as deprecated for now. And then we'd start with a new, a new unit test that verifies that the current behavior that we're expecting is not part of the system yet. But this test is a lot easier requires very little setup and no mocks. And implementing it would probably not be that hard either. So that was what I wanted to show you today, an example of actual code from our actual code base that we looked at and that we refactored without a clue of what we're doing. No looking at the actual code smells with the actual refactorings, but just something that with a little bit of feeling and a goal, 
is perfectly achievable. We locked down the behavior of our current system, created scaffolding so that we were safe to experiment a little bit. We failed once, and fortunately the tests were there to save us, even though the tests weren't very good. We happily used mocks and just as happily got rid of them. And we were able to refactor the domain guided by tests. Thank you very much.